a very warm welcome. Thank you for tuning in. You're looking at the moment at a 17th century title page, A Complete History of the Most Remarkable Providences by a man called William Turner. In it, there is a chapter on epitaphs, and you will notice over here we have uh, William Shakespeare, number 17. In fact, you probably notice also that the E seems to have been lopped off at the end of the name Shakespeare, creating a name of exactly the 17 letters. Here, you're looking at the title page of a book of epigrams by a brilliant man called Samuel Shepherd, who wrote almost exclusively of poetry and poets, and he knew an awful lot about it, and he uh, knows all the gossip. He certainly knows who Shakespeare is, but I'm not going to go into that in huge detail. It's a book of epigrams. Let's just skip straight to um, number 17, and we see that it's number 17 is in memory of our famous Shakespeare. Now, the question is, is it a coincidence that 17 was the number of Shakespeare's entry in the Turner book and that this is epigram 17 in another book? Is it just a coincidence, those numbers? Or perhaps does it have anything to do with the fact that Shakespeare was the 17th Earl of Oxford, that, that every time Shakespeare comes up, he is 17th? That's what we're going to explore. First of all, I just want to give you a little sense of the importance of numbers in the Renaissance, much more important than they are to us now. So we might say, oh, well, you can allude to Shakespeare as the 17th, if you want, in order to show that he's the 17th Earl of Oxford, but that's all you're doing. Um, back in the Renaissance, things were a little different. The Renaissance mind had a firm belief that the whole universe was created by God using letters and numbers. And if two things are connected to the same number, then God himself is connecting the two things. There is a divine connection. And of course, the most obvious divine connection one can think of is truth. Ego sum veritas, as Jesus says, I am the truth. So you can connect numbers through um, uh, to, to show the truth of their correlation. And equally, you can say the same thing about anagrams. I've heard a lot of people saying to me, oh, you're just, you're just a conspiracy theorist, you're playing around with anagrams. Well, yes, anagrams would have been extremely exciting to people of the Elizabethan age. In fact, we know they were. And William Camden, that great historian living in the Elizabethan age, accused those who do not take anagrams seriously of being the sour sort. So we don't want to seem ourselves to be the sour sort. We want to realise that there are uh, divine correlations, at least in the mind of the Renaissance, when connecting um, two different things by the same letters or by a number. So let's um, continue with a few examples. We, we've looked at this uh, dedication of the sonnets, and you'll remember how it's divided up into three triangles of six, two, and four. And that, of course, is the same um, letter spacing as Edward de Vere, six letters, two letters, and four letters. When we look at uh, Sonnet 84, this is addressed to Shakespeare's Sonnet 84, which is addressed to the dark lady of the sonnets, who we now know is um, Penelope Rich. Uh, lots of clues in here that she's Penelope Rich. Who is it that says most, which can say more than this rich praise, that you alone are you? And of course, that reminds us of lines addressed directly to Penelope Rich at the same time by Gervais Markham. Um, but you, oh you, you that alone are you. What's going on with all this yous and alones? Well, they're all taking the piss, really, out of Philip Sidney, who famously wrote the Astrophil and said Stella sonnets to Penelope Rich, and one of those poems saying, to you, to you, only in you, only for you, to you, to you, to you, only to you, only through you, and et cetera, et cetera. So Markham and Shakespeare are rather laughing at this way of addressing um, Penelope Rich, but that's not necessarily what I'm trying to talk about here now. Obviously, the word rich is a clue that we're addressing Penelope Rich as, of course, the two pens that you see in the line at the bottom there. In fact, the first of those pens, if I were to just move it backwards, you see it reads pen backwards. Pen, and at the end of the line, L, we're nearly saying Penelope. If you look at the second of those two pens, and you've got pen, and then at the end of the line, L, Penel. Heavy hints that we're talking about Penelope Rich, but what I'm really trying to focus on is the numerical hint, sonnet um, 84. Penelope is eight letters long, rich, 
four letters long, so you bring the two together. You've got eight four Penelope Rich. So it's very important ways in which the subtle Renaissance mind used to think. We don't think like that now, so we're just not used to it, but that's what I'm trying to uh, draw to your attention. Um, this published in 1633 by Thomas Bancroft, Glutton's Fever. You'll see that Shakespeare is named um, down there um, on the 17th line, um, the, the 17th word of that sentence, beginning on the 17th uh, line indeed. If we move to this book, um, another one by Thomas Bancroft of 1639, a book of epigrams and epitaphs. Well, he doesn't quite unsubtly um, 118 is Shakespeare's epitaph, not number 17, but look what he does. He puts another epitaph immediately beneath it to the same, so it's to Shakespeare as well. And then he puts a little bracket of 17 letters, um, or shook thy spear, talking, don't forget, talking to Shakespeare. So he's pulling this out really as a sort of obvious pseudonym which he places on line 17. So the 17 words in the bracket, or shook thy spear on line 17, is having precisely the same effect, which is to connect the pseudonym of Shakespeare to the number 17, the 17th, back to this idea of the 17th Earl of Oxford. So looking at other examples of Shakespeare at the time being listed as 17th, this is a difficult book to understand, a very religious book by the uh, poet and playwright Thomas Hayward, who certainly knew a thing or two about uh, Shakespeare. He has a chapter in this book where he talks about the honour done to poets of old. It's an odd thing he's talking about here. He's talking about the way uh, po classical poets used to get given an extra name to honour them. So, for instance, uh, Publius Ovidius Naso, that's who we generally call Ovid, was given the name Sulmonensis to give him a bit more um, honour. And equally, Publius Virgilius, that's Virgil, uh, had the name Marrow in addition. So he goes through a number of these um, classical people showing how they gained extra names. And then he compares them to English, just over the page, uh, Robert Greene, Christopher Marlowe, Kidd, etc. And it'll come perhaps as no surprise to you again that 17th in that list is William Shakespeare. Quite interesting, actually, this one. Notice how the, how the William in that margent note uh, it doesn't have a capital W, as if there's something a bit suspect about that being his name. And the hyphen, which you could attribute to the line break. But if you look at the text by which it's set, mellifluous shake hyphen spear, whose enchanting quill commanded mirth or passion was but will. Um, you don't have to have a dirty mind to see quite easily that there are dirty um, scurrilous undertones to that line. Um, whose enchanting quill commanded mirth or passion. We've looked at this in quite a number of other presentations I put online about the uh, slightly sordid scandal that poor old um, Edward de Vere, William Shakespeare, is involved in. Um, but here he is but will notice, um, and that of course comes on the 17th line from the bottom. He is but will, reminding us also, I think, of the wonderful Shakespearean sonnet in which Shakespeare tells us that he's using Will as a pseudonym, Sonnet 136. My name is Will, and my will one. Among a number one is reckoned none, then in the number let me pass untold. So he's telling you there that Will is the, is the sort of cover. He wants to pass untold, unnoticed behind the pseudonym Will. But here we see Hayward, he once again lists Shakespeare as the 17th in the list, and he places that pseudonym 17th line up from the bottom. This is a manuscript in the British Library. I don't think it's been published as such, like this at least. Um, it's by a man called Edmund Bolton, and I think comes from about 1616, so very contemporary with the whole Shakespearean story. And he's writing about good English and trying to give some examples of writers who one should read if one wants to know how to speak or write very good English. So he starts lists, listing them on the next page with Thomas More, Sydney, Queen Elizabeth, etc., etc., uh, Hooker, Raleigh, Francis Bacon. I think you can probably see where this is, where this is heading. Um, Michael Drayton, uh, Christopher Marlowe, and yes, uh, once again. So we've, we're have we constantly seeing. There aren't that many lists that are long enough to hold over 17 names of poets in them at this time, but it seems like they all the ones that there are all seem to place Shakespeare at number 17. So I hope I'm 
just beginning to wear away at the edges of resistance for those of you who would like to say this is just all coincidence. How many of these lists can there be in this contemporary age where Shakespeare is 17th? Um, let's move on to Michael Drayton, The Battle of Agincourt, first published in 1626, which includes this rather wonderful poem, actually, to my dearly beloved friend, Henry Reynolds, Esquire, of Poets and Poesy. So he writes a poem all about poets, and he basically trots through a little history of poets, mainly in chronological order, starting with Mantua and Virgil, then Elderton, and on he goes through Gower, Surrey, Wyatt, Bryan, Gascoigne, Churchyard, goes over the page, Spencer, Sydney. Again, I'm absolutely certain you know where I'm heading with this. Um, Nash, and yes, again, Shakespeare is the 17th, exactly what he was in the Edmund Bolton, exactly what he was in Hayward. Uh, we're just going to go on and on and on, saying that this is a uh, mere coincidence. Anthony Davenport in the mid-17th uh, century, 1651, I think this is. Here you've got a poem which is written out in italics. The normal thing is to write in uh, not italics, oh, sorry, I'm getting the word for that, um, and put italics in to emphasise certain words. But quite often you will see it like this, where the, actually the main text is in italics and the emphasised words are not in italics. So you'll see the first one here is astrophil. That's a, actually a, an allusion to Philip Sidney. And if I were to look through that, those emphasised words, the non-italicised words are standing out from the ita italic text, then again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to surprise you. Um, Shakespeare is the 17th of the emphasised words to Anthony Davenport. I may have shown you this before, this is a very early example. 1598, Palladis Tamir by Francis Mears, Wit's Treasury, and I think those of you who have seen it will have seen an analysis I've given of paragraph 34 of this comparative discourse of English poets with classical poets if you remember in that presentation. By the way, if you haven't seen it, it's called uh, Francis Mears New, and I strongly recommend it. I'm just going to show a very simplified uh, point of this here. So this is paragraph 34, and one of the interesting things, obviously, one of the properties of 34 is it's twice 17. And what he's done here is to balance 16 classical authors against 17 English authors. And the clue about it being paragraph 34 is say, watch out, concentrate, because actually two of the English are both number 17, they're actually the same person. If you count the words from the end of the paragraph, then the 17th word from the end is Shakespeare, 17th word from the end. If you count the names, the actual names of playwrights from the end, then the 17th playwright is the Earl of Oxford. So once again, he's using 17th to uh, lay a clue to the fact that Edward, uh, Earl of Oxford, is actually the same as Shakespeare. So they're both numbered 17, and that's showing the divine will, the divine truth, ego sum veritas, the truth that lies behind them, is exemplified by the use of 17th for both of them. Um, I think, again, I've, I've shown you this, which is Polymantia, even older. This one comes from 1595, so only two years after the name Shakespeare first appears in print in any literary context. And that, of course, is on the dedication to Venus and Adonis in 1593. This comes out two years later, and it's called Polymantia. I have shown it to you before, but I just want to highlight something that I don't think you have noticed. We're looking at the bottom uh, of the left-hand page there, if I just bring it up bigger. There you'll see that the 17th um, full uh, word from the end is Oxford. Well, of course, it's an allusion to the 17th Earl of Oxford. And I got that by just counting the words in the main text. If I were to count the words backwards from the bottom, including those words which are in the uh, margin note, then, of course, the 17th word is Shakespeare. So exactly the same trick as Mears was playing. This, by the way, supposedly by someone called William Covell. Covell's playing exactly the same trick as Mears did. Um, he's making both Shakespeare and Oxford 17th, so that we know they're, they're one and the same. Um, I have also done a, a, a long decryption of this, and I really urge anyone who hasn't seen it to have a look at it. Um, it's on my uh, 
uh, channel. Um, and those who have seen it will remember exactly how it works that Delia at the top of this triangle is identified as uh, Henry Rosalie, the parallel of Rosalie. Fortunately, fortunately, Cleopatra is Penelope Rich and Sweet Shakespeare is Our de Vere, a secret sitting underneath Oxford, which, as I say, is the 17th word from the end, 17th Earl of Oxford, and Shakespeare being the 17th word if you're counting the margin notes. Um, sorry to go over that. Do have a look at the presentation if you haven't seen it. You're looking now, most of you will recognise this. It's the dedication to Oxford's son-in-law, um, Philip Lord Montgomery, and his brother, William Lord Pembroke, both ardent Freemasons. This is the de dedication uh, to Shakespeare's first folio, the great book, published in 1623, which has 36 of Shakespeare's plays in it, 18 of those published for the very first time, 1623. This dedication is written by Hemmings and Condell, the actors, I think they were pretty sure actually that they were also Freemasons. Um, the first time they uh, mentioned Shakespeare, you can see it on this page in a, a sort of interesting, the name Shakespeare comes out and capitalised like that, and it's placed um, the 17th line from the end. In the uh, next to it, you can see to the great variety of readers, a letter also, Hemmings and Connell, they don't actually mention Shakespeare by name there, but they ensure that the First paragraph is 17 lines long. The theme of 17 comes a lot in the first folio. Um, here, of course, Ben Jonson's famous tribute to uh, to William Shakespeare, um, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. That's 17, 17 words long, very deliberately. And then he sets off writing his poem, and guess what? He doesn't begin his poem until line 17. When he writes, I therefore will begin, well, name another poem that begins on the 17th line, let alone um, a, a poem that happens to be all about Shakespeare with a 17-word title that begins on the 17th line. I therefore will begin, soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage, my Shakespeare rise. So very much distancing my Shakespeare from the uh, Shakespeare of the people, the misunderstanding in the first 16 lines of those who might be led to envy his name um, by silliest ignorance, blind affection or crafty malice. But of course, what I'm really drawing your attention to here is this cunning, clever, um, and I might say quite typical use of 17, 17th, to be absolutely precise, to connect him to the 17th Earl of Oxford. We turn the page and we see another tribute to Shakespeare by Hugh Holland. Um, I think there are certain clues on how to look at this. Notice it's called Upon the Lines, and then if you look at the last two lines, we have his lines, his lines. So three times we've got the word lines or line. Um, I think he's doing that on purpose. When you get threes, you're, you, you really are meant to sit up and look at them. I would say that these three lines are suggesting perhaps that you count the lines. So if you look at the lines um, to which Hugh Holland subscribes his name, you see there are 17 lines there. In fact, were you to um, count the words of the poem, then the 17th word is Shakespeare's. So again, 17, 17, very, very, very strongly, 17th to be precise. I keep, I keep going to put the 17th because that's what we're really getting at. It's not just the number 17. In each of these cases, it's 17th, and it's the 17th Earl of Oxford that is, is being alluded to here. Um, back, to the, back to the front page of the uh, first folio of Shakespeare of 1623, same book we're looking at now. This poem by Ben Jonson to the left. I know we've looked at it in other contexts before. I think it's worth noting, though, that the 17th word from the end is ever. And now ever, I accept, is, is quite a common word, and one can't get too overexcited every time the word ever comes up. But I think whenever is numbered 17th, um, you are being given a clue to think about this word as E. Vere, Edward Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. In fact, you see it says ever writ. And those of you who have seen my presentation on this particular poem, which is called uh, Ben Johnson New, please have a look at it if you haven't seen it. You'll see that there's a message that's hidden in this poem, um, which says uh, Vere had his wit, Vere writ 
his book. And that ever writ, you see, is together. So again, it's cluing you in that that ever is supposed to represent Edward de Vere, and it's the 17th um, word from the end. This is quite a common trick, actually, this 17th word from the end. Before I just pass to another example of it, I'd like you to look at that very strange spelling of do with a double O. Remember that Oxford is the 17th Earl of Oxford, and uh, why is he giving us too many O's in there? Obviously, O's are important. Let's count them up. Uh, no surprises. There are 17 O's there. And so, yeah, ever is the 17th word with 17 O's. So Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, is being clued into you there. Quite a large number of years earlier, I think 1598, Richard Barnfield published this poem, which you can see on the right there, a remembrance of some English poets. Now, I've just shown you how Ben Jonson makes ever the 17th, Evia, the 17th word from the end of his poem. Um, he may have got the idea from Barnfield. There, there's your ever. Live ever you. Remember, this is tacked on to the end of the uh, last two lines of the verse all about Shakespeare. Live ever you, at least in fame, live ever. Well may the body die, but fame die never. Those of you who have looked up fame, or particularly in fame, and you can see how in fame is in that line there, and, and also in the, the line above, thy name in fame. In fame and fame both could mean uh, something pretty terrible, like infamous. And again, this is another attack on poor old Edward de Vere as Shakespeare, and a bit revealing. The 17th word from the end, as I say, is Evia, 17th Earl of Oxford, and that occurs on the 17th line. Down. So same same trick really being being played to us once again. This this seventeenth uh, word from the end being ever. Here's this picture of William Shakespeare. I know I've taken you through this. It's an engraving by Marshall with a little poem underneath. Um, if we take the uh, W M sculpts it. Take W M. That's William Marshall. But take it as one, and that's absolutely proper to do that. It's not two words. W M. It's an initial for one name. So count backwards from there, and we have the same thing ever is the 17th from the end. And once again, this is doing exactly the same as Barnfield was doing. By making it the 17th letter from the end, he's he's prodding you to read that as E. Vere, uh, Edward de Vere. So for E. Vere, I instead of or in place of E. Vere, live thy fame the world to tell, thy like no age shall ever parallel. He's insulting someone. Now, those of you who've seen the presentation I put up not long ago, um, called William Marshall New, will remember that I identified those last two lines as being addressed to someone other than Shakespeare. It wasn't difficult to do that. If you look at the six lines above, you see we're talking of Shakespeare and talking of his designs, his lines, his works. He's being addressed in the third person. And then suddenly on the uh, line I've highlighted ever there, forever live thy fame. So someone else is being... Um, is being addressed. And in that presentation, William Marshall knew, I suggested that it was this shadow at the top, i.e. the picture. Um, I was being a bit too quick for my own good there, because if you think about it, this shadow is also in the third person, so there's no reason he, the shadow should suddenly be thy fame. So I realised I'm wrong about that. Um, I'm sorry. Generally speaking, when, if I find I've made a mistake, I just correct it in another presentation, which is what I'm doing now. So I'm not going to remake that Marshall one. And I wasn't far off. The thy fame, he's talking to William Marshall. Um, so forever, instead of Evia, live thy fame. Remember, fame can mean infamy. The world to tell, thy like, no age shall ever parallel. This is an insult to William Marshall, who sculpts it, the, the man who made the picture. Now, I'm not the only person to have realised, although I realised rather late, that William Marshall is being attacked in these last two lines. Um, five years later, that's in 1645, John Milton published his book of poems, very much the same layout as the Shakespeare poems that you've just been looking at, and very obviously um, what we call taking the piss out of the Shakespeare book. You can see, uh, once again, William Marshall has provided the portrait, this time of Milton, with his arm, right arm funnily all bound up, and there's some Greek lines underneath, and underneath those Greek lines, we've got exactly the same thing as we had on the Shakespeare, W.M. Sculp. Um, if you translate those lines, 
Um, this is what they say. They're in ancient Greek, of course. You might say that this image was drawn by an untutored hand when you look upon the original figure, and you friends who do not recognise the engraving laugh at the botched likeness made by a low-grade artist. So poor old William Marshall was obviously having to draw out those Greek words, not knowing what they even said, and write William Marshall at the end of them, sculpts it. Um, very humiliating for poor old Marshall, but clearly uh, Milton is drawing on the joke because he recognises perfectly well that in the last two lines here we have exactly the same thing, and William Marshall is being insulted. Uh, and so poor Marshall puts his initials at the end again. Strange place to put it because normally you'd put WM sculpts it near the picture, not at the end of the poem. Sorry, that, as you well know, because I'm talking about the number 17, was a very uh, discursive and off the point. Um, I just want to go over one thing here, apropos of that presentation called William Marshall New. Um, those of you who read the comments, and people are starting to put comments down, I'm very grateful for them, thank you all. Those who read the comments will see that uh, a kind scholar called Julie Bianchi left a note saying actually she didn't think that in this picture what Shakespeare's clutching is a wreath at all, uh, but it's an acacia, and therefore is a symbol of Freemasonry, and so is the white glove. Well, uh, as many of you will know, I'm absolutely certain that uh, William Shakespeare is involved in Freemasonry and that those who were involved in uh, keeping his real identity from the public, while, by the way, still giving it away with their clever little clues, were Freemasons. Um, the Freemasons, as I've shown countless times, uh, referred to Shakespeare, or Edward de Vere and Shakespeare, the combined, as 1740. So I thought to myself, well, if... if uh, that is an acacia and not a wreath, and those are gloves, and it is something to do with masons. Then we should look for a sign that the the it was forty is there. We've seen seventeen. The seventeenth word from the end is ever, and you can see down the down the line on the left we've got three T's, and just next to ever we've got four T with a fourth T there. So I think Julie is right. I think uh, this is a uh, a book that was put together by masons who knew exactly who Shakespeare was and and knew how to refer to him according to that uh, Masonic um, nickname, as it were, 1740, which of course also puns with the numbers 17 and 40. If you move on in that same book, there's this poem by John Warren. Again, sorry to keep advertising my wares, but I, I would recommend, if you haven't seen it, a presentation called John Warren New, where I go very carefully through this poem and shows how John Warren knows that Edward de Vere is William Shakespeare. Um, in that presentation, I drew attention to this funny space. You can see I'm highlighting it there. It shouldn't really be there. And that space is drawing it in itself drawing attention to the line next to it, which has too few syllables. All the lines in this poem have ten syllables, except for this one. Tis love that thus to thee is shown, which only has eight. The labour's his, the glory still thine own. So he deliberately left out a name, and we need to know what that name is. Two English literature professors, um, Gary Taylor and um, Stanley Wells, uh, had the audacity to reprint this poem and put Tis Benson's love that thus to thee is shown, the labour's his, the glory still thine own. As if Benson wrote these poems and William Shakespeare of Stratford got the glory for them. Um, Benson was not a writer, he was a publisher. And what these two professors are doing is quite naughty because they've just added the word Benson's and a, a, a truly scholarly way of doing this is to put a square bracket around Benson's to show it's an editorial insertion. You don't just put it as though that's how the poem was originally written because it wasn't as we can see on the left. So um, there are actually clues to the proper name that's meant to go in there, the two syllables that are missing. We've got that big double V, many of you will know that's refers, refers to De Vere. He used double V as his own pseudonym sometimes. And we're William Shakespeare of Stratford is being addressed here as verbious like. And of course, that's bis, meaning twice or double, and via, double of via. He's like a double of via. So you've got lots of clues about which name should be placed in as the, mm -mm, yes, you've guessed it, the 17th word of this poem. And clearly, it has to be the 17th Earl of Oxford. Tis Oxford's love that thus to thee is shown. 
the labours his, i.e. he wrote all the poems, the glory still thine own, i.e. Stratford Shaxburg, don't worry, we're still praising you for writing them because we're all quite ignorant and we don't realise that Oxford actually wrote them. Um, but what, again, what I'm really drawing to your attention here is the fact that Oxford's, the missing word, the missing name is the 17th, and yes, he is the 17th Earl of Oxford. Um, I finally just should show you again just just for those who are interested in this 1740 business that that brings the 40s down against Oxford's name so Oxford's 17th word with the 40s you've got 1740 and that reminds us of the date of course 1740 there's no accident why in 1740 um, Shakespeare's monument in which we now know is placed directly above the uh, burial spot of Edward de Vere Shakespeare's monument uh, has a quotation from Shakespeare in which the cloud cup towers at the top shouldn't be at the top they put the a line that comes lower down at the top they've taken out one of the E's of towers in order to have 17 letters across the top and four T's uh, down the left hand margin 1740 and of course now we understand uh, why the monument was placed on um, the 17th Earl of Oxford's burial spot in 1740, and we understand why Shakespeare is pointing to the word temples, because it's all to do with the, the Masons. Um, look, that was quite a gallop, um, which I've just done in one take. I hope it makes sense. I really hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope if any of you are wary of these uh, coincidences, that you realise just the more you pile on, the less they are possibly a coincidence, that the connection of the number 17, uh, or the 17th most specifically, is all tied in and is as plain as a pike staff and as plain as the fact that 10 plus 7 equals 17. You've got it. Thank you very much indeed for watching. I hope you followed it. I hope it's enjoyable and please subscribe and press the bell button if you haven't done so already and you will be informed every time a new presentation is downloaded. Uploaded, I think is the correct word. Thank you.